is really, really interesting. Um, so today, um, I'm going to be speaking about Nicosia. My research has been mostly focusing on Nicosia. Um, the, the talk is uh, Conflict Transformation Art in Nicosia is actually um, a chapter in a book that's coming out uh, called Contemporary Art from Cyprus, Politics, Identity, Culture Across Borders from Bloomsbury. And uh, it, I'm co-editing it with uh, Gabriel Gureas and Elena Stiliano. Um, now, uh, in the paper, I will be thinking of how the ethno-national context a um, uh, divided city context of Nicosia and how socially engaged art practices, or I interpret them as such, have been used as a tool for conflict transformation and a means to cultivate cultural exchange, empathy, dialogue, and at a certain stage where a big statement of activism. Um, in actual fact, uh, this research um, was part of my PhD, so I did a, social, a, a PhD focusing on social practice and I did these three projects. And what I'm presenting today is actually the research that came out from the first project I carried out in Nicosia in 2010. Um, I will present a, a few case studies uh, that illustrate this development of uh, conflict transformation and how it relates to uh, the development of socially engaged practice. Uh, the projects were executed from 1992 to 2006, which represents a time in, um, in Cyprus which, where we moved from complete ethnic segregation, so total border closure, to a time of controlled border crossings. And I think of how the actual practice shifted from people and artists focusing on building relationships, on getting to know each other, to almost a local cultural product that we are exporting abroad. Um, now, Nicosia itself is a, very much explored via the status of a divided city and, um, and the lens of how art comes into conflict transformation has been something that is expanding. Uh, these are the projects I will be talking about, Off Limits uh, in 1992, um, a project in Gotland, Sweden in 1999, and then two projects uh, following the opening of the borders in 2005 and 2006, where we see the really um, the contemporary art market coming to Cyprus and playing on this uh, um, on the divided city almost as a sexy type of um, uh, playground. Now, um, first of all, I want to start with uh, Nicosia and its context as this divided urban space. Uh, at the moment, urban conflicts are hugely accepted to transform how urban spaces are used, interpreted. Um, in the last 10 to 15 years, there's actually been a lot of attention uh, on how conflicts, uh, whether religious, ethnic, national, have shaped European and Middle Eastern cities, and how such cities divide, absorb, resist, and potentially play a role in reconsidering territorial and social conflict. Um, partitioned urban settings uh, like Nicosia, Jerusalem, Belfast, Mostar, they're often marked by this ethnic division and identity politics, which are very much reflected in how the urban environment is negotiated. So walls, barbed wire fences, dead ends, intensification of ethno-nationalism, a lot of uh, military presence have shaped an academic discipline that examines these urban milieus through a very interdisciplinary framework. Framework. Um, writing about Jerusalem, uh, Philip Miselvitz and Tim Renetz introduced the idea of conflict urbanism to describe the relationship between political violence and the production of urban space. Uh, this is the definition used um, in this present analysis is in relation to Nicosia, where we've been experiencing division since the early 1960s. The buffer zone that divides the cities, which varies from about, uh, let's say, three meters to almost three kilometers on the periphery, is called the Green Line. And it's essentially the demarcation line uh, with the two rounds of military fighting seizing in 1974. The buffer zone or the dead zone or the green line as we call it um, actually hasn't shifted. I mean, in, if you look at the case of uh, Israel, we see that there it, it shifts quite a bit. In Cyprus, it doesn't shift and it's been quite fixed. Uh, 
Um, the anthropologist uh, Yael Navarro uh, Yashin um, actually has written quite a bit about Cyprus, uh, the north of the island as well. And the way that she writes about it and she tries to describe this intense military presence um, is that soldiers are everywhere. We've got guns, rifles, uniforms. But when you live in the city, interestingly, you, you sort of choose, I mean, it becomes part of the landscape. Uh, and it's also being in the way that the city has promoted itself uh, as a tourist uh, destination. You know, come see uh, this unique characteristic. So the creative city model that you were talking in Cyprus, in fact, in Nicosia, has been based on uh, we are a divided um, capital. Um, uh, Cyprus is an interesting case study in terms of the way um, that the UN has had a really uh, long-term presence on the island. So from 1964 onwards, they've been based here. And um, it's been actually criticized in the way um, that the agenda of the national powers that largely fund this international organizations and their long-term presence in places uh, of conflict. Um, now, the position of Nicosia um, as this divided capital has placed it within uh, two frameworks, that of the divided cities and that of conflict studies. There are a multitude of conflict-related seminars, conferences, workshops, artistic residencies, summer schools, uh, research studies that explore, challenge, and capitalize on this kind of iconic uh, scar. Um, and this brings me to the next part where um, I'm just going to introduce this idea of art and conflict and antagonism and how it relates to the case of Cyprus. Um, art started to become integrated into peace building and social change initiatives and it expanded beyond um, uh, also um, that framework and we see it in parallel with the rise, I mean, uh, or at least when I started to explore uh, Cyprus and I was trying to think what was the social practice at the local level, this was uh, what I encountered. Um, in parallel to this rise of the socially engaged practice and the professionalization of the field, we also see this interest in conflict rising increasingly. Uh, so um, you have many exhibitions, uh, books coming out and so forth where um, uh, conflict is, is presented as this cultural product, particularly in the 21st century, uh, where we are saturated, appalled, disappointed, and anesthetized by the spectacles of war, xenophobia, failed interventions, feeling of individual impotence, and feeling sidetracked almost um, uh, through the repetitive images of war and strife uh, that we're encountered with, whereas in, where in, which in Cyprus are particularly close to us. Now, um, over the last 30 years, uh, peace building within um, and how it's used by art, or how art has been used in peace building, rejected the traditional form of anti-war peace art imagery that was used to depict desolation, misery, horrors, and so forth, and started to focus on social contact and engagement. And we see that through a different type of literature uh, that deals with peace building, um, uh, but Craig Zelizer, who um, is a political scientist but writes a lot on the use of community arts in the context of conflict transformation um, has been a dominant figure in how artistic practice is used and how um, the community potential of artistic practice is used not just within the war context but also in the post-conflict one. Um, da -da 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 -da. Uh, now uh, one of the most important features uh, in um, art's ability to, uh, let's say, be used in conflict transformation has been uh, its perceived uh, ability to build social bonds and relationships. Uh, for me, it was very impressive, like when, you, when I was reading about it, how much art was assumed to do uh, when you were thinking, you know? Uh, it, it was as if you, need, you didn't have civic change, but that art could become this glue that unifies us. Uh, the 1990s was particularly important in Cyprus uh, for this rise of the arts within uh, the bicommunal collaboration between Greek and Turkish Cypriots. So, 
Now, uh, for me, uh, the biggest influence on this type of collaboration was the Nicosia Master Plan. The Nicosia Master Plan um, was something that was developed in 1979 following the successful collaborations of the two mayors of the divided city uh, for um, a, a sewage, for a common sewage uh, uh, project. So it's quite interesting because, you know, uh, people were saying a lot, united by our shit. Um, uh, and so following that, uh, the Nicosia Master Plan was developed with the two mayors accepting it and then uh, very quickly being placed un under the United Nations Development Program. The United Nations Development Program in the mid-90s started to run training programs organized in the buffer zone and which aimed to um, uh, develop a system of collective action for future peace building activities and these included training for uh, special exhibitions as they were called so art, photography um, and other types of works and they didn't bring uh, large amounts of people but as the UN uh, uh, actually positions it they served as important symbols of peaceful coexistence. Um, in 1998 we had a bicommunal project launch um, under different type of names, but it was funded by USAID and the UNDP, um, and, uh, and it was to benefit uh, Greek and Turkish Cypriots and contribute to peace building. Just to give you an indication, between 98 and 2004, it supported by communal projects with over $60 million, uh, funded exclusively from USAID, and there was an increasing in 2002 on projects related to culture and art, uh, I'm not going to talk about it here, but I think it really the Nicosia Master Plan contributed to the paving of the gentrification of the inner city of Nicosia, which at the moment, like it went from the 90s where it was inhabited by artists, um, and from 2008 until now, the change of how quickly it went from independent cafes to H&M coming in is actually uh, very, very impressive. Um, we have various uh, artists and writers that started to write about the importance uh, of um, this phenomenon uh, of how conflict has been used and how it has developed a sort of art form uh, within the context of Nicosia. Uh, and when uh, I've interviewed, uh, for example, Adhiro Dumazu, who has developed a plethora of programs from 2003 onwards, uh, bringing Greek and Turkish Cypriots together, like she really positions that it's the human level. So even if you're working with people and you manage to shift one person's perception in terms of uh, working with people from across the divide, that that, that has some type of meaning, um, that that has meaning. Um, uh, and we have, um, you know, different kind of names put to it, the art of the buffer zone, for example, or... Um, the in-between space, buffer zone art, uh, conflict transformation art, it's all part of this discussion. Uh, the first example I'm gonna uh, look at is uh, Off Limits. Off Limits was an exhibition uh, that was initiated by Haris Palabai Shodis, uh, a photographer and an art, uh, artist uh, uh, practitioner. Um, this was initiated in London uh, and I think London is a very important place uh, for the development of uh, the contact of Greek and Turkish Cypriots. Uh, the reason being that it, it's not the ethnic capital of either of the two sides. You know, it's not Athens, it's not you know Ankara, Istanbul, or whatever. But it's a common ground. Um, and um, Bella Baishotis traces. Uh, the bicommunal collaboration back to London of the late 70s and, um, and talks a lot about his involvement in community art practices and also the documentary photography art movement. Um, he had an organization that he set up in London and um, he was working in this very fertile ground with Greek and Turkish Cypriots and there was very iconic uh, moments of encounter there, one being for example Mario Stogas and Neshe Yashin in 1991 and the creation of these shared spaces. Um, this was also falling within a time frame where we saw in London, you know, the community art movement and, and how that had uh, grown and been placed under the Greater Lo uh, London Council uh, funding programs. And um, 
uh, Bella Baishodis initiated this. He got together with Ilke Mehmet, who was also living in London, and they invited one Greek Cypriot and another Turkish Cypriot to photograph um, on either side of the divide. At that moment, the segregation was absolute. So there was no visual contact, so people didn't even know, you know, um, uh, even visually uh, how each side, um, uh, you know, how it looked <laughs> and how it had changed. And so their idea was uh, to place this exhibition in the buffer zone, in this, uh, in the checkpoint, Lidra Palace checkpoint, which was the only uh, crossing point and where all of the um, uh, leader discussions were always held under UN auspices. Um, when it was uh, going to be, um, uh, when it was starting to run, um, in the press, it was actually written as being the first of its kind because it was showing, you know, beyond the line in all its stark uh, reality. And they were trying to go beyond the propaganda. Uh, at that point, um, as uh, the artists uh, talked about, you know, there was hardly any contact zone, and you almost felt. Um, uh, you know, judged and looked down upon because you were going um, against the dominant narrative. Um, the exhibition actually never took place in the buffer zone because at that point the UN needed the permission from both sides to actually allow for any event to take place um, and at the last moment the Turkish Cypriot Authority pulled out so subsequently this exhibition which was meant to be accessible to both was only presented in the south of Nicosia and then in Nuremberg in Germany and also in Derry in Ireland. Um, but it, it became a very interesting uh, point for me uh, to start thinking, one, because it was hardly written about, no one had written about this uh, exhibition, but also because of how related to the community art movement and how the artist himself could trace that idea uh, uh, back to it. The second uh, um, meeting was uh, in 1999. It was the first large-scale meeting between artists of uh, you know, different fields, uh, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. It didn't take place uh, in Cyprus, but in, in, in Sweden. There was about 17 Greek Cypriots and uh, 12 Turkish Cypriots. Uh, it was initiated by Nikin Marangu and Neshe Yashin. Um, and it really aimed uh, to promote contact, communication, and actually just people to get to know one another. Uh, with interviews I carried out, uh, not from the visual arts, but uh, from Fikosan, uh, uh, Zanos and um, uh, Yorgos Moleskis, uh, who is a poet, and uh, they said that it actually did manage to cultivate those relationships. Uh, this was supported again by international bodies. All of these events have been, uh, such um, as the UN, and then uh, in this case uh, also um, uh, the Nordic countries, the Swedish artistic uh, unions. And um, they really aimed to uh, build relationships and then for the artists themselves to go back to the communities and kind of disseminate uh, this way of thinking. Again, uh, it, was more, uh, it was a more closed um, environment at the time. Now, um, and, and this is where we see uh, a lot of the language that we have, uh, you know, you encounter in socially engaged theoretical writing almost uh, resonating or working in parallel with some of the literature that you see written in context of, you know, development of, or conflict transformation. You know, art not being an end in itself, a means to achieve an additional goal, uh, having being an educational or a therapeutic instrument, uh, and so forth. Um, these are some examples uh, of the visual artists and, and what they presented uh, in Gertland. Uh, particularly interesting for me uh, is Emin Cezinel's um, uh, artwork. Uh, Emin Cezinel is a Turkish Cypriot artist um, and in this context he produced a series of 12 paintings uh, called The First Supper, One of You Will Not Betray Me. Um, adopting really very uh, a religious symbolism, you know, like, you know, uh, of the Last Supper, but in this case the First Supper, um, uh, and also the Christian parable being opposite to the perceived religious divide, obviously, with Turkish Cypriot being uh, Muslim and Greek Cypriot Christian. Um, and, um, and it was very empathetic, like through his, you know, it places the feet there, um, the, the, 
the action of washing each other's feet and also uh, coming close, this idea of humility and uh, accepting opposing viewpoints and perhaps overcoming prejudices. Um, he doesn't feel that this is an easy task uh, and it was uh, very obvious um, also uh, when I spoke to him about it. Um, but at the time, I think there was uh, some sort of um, hope uh, in terms of how the arts could function uh, in cultivating uh, uh, sentiments of empathy. Uh, and, um, and I find that this idea of empathy is very interesting uh, in our case because it in contrast to sympathy, it starts from the position where you acknowledge your alterity of identification, so your difference. Uh, and Jill Bennett, who writes uh, from an art historical perspective, when she examines artistic, artistic practices that demonstrates uh, conjunctions of effective and critical operations, um, uh, positions in this idea of empathetic vision. And uh, you find that echoed in Grant Kester, who writes a lot on, on social practice, as an empathetic insight. And that this is a very necessary component of a dialogical aesthetic, which is how uh, he presents um, um, his interpretation of social practice. Um, now, this idea of cultivating empathy and relationships, uh, for me, transforms, uh, and we're going to see it a bit uh, in the next two projects I'm going to mention, uh, after the lifting of the restrictions to movement in 2003 and the rejection of the Anand plan in, uh, by the Greek Cypriots. Uh, this project, uh, called Leaps of Faith, uh, was the first international uh, public or new genre public art project that took place in the buffer zone. Uh, of Nicosia in 2005. It was initiated by Rana Sinchir and curated by Katarina Grevu from Greece and Erdan Kosova from Turkey. Uh, 22 artists took part in the exhibition, Greek, Turkish Cypriots, um, a, um, a lot of them from uh, countries also affected by uh, long-term uh, conflict and war. Uh, the projects took place in buffer zones, in, um, in the buffer zone in empty shops, surrounding the buffer zone, uh, and etc. Now, the intention was actually to trigger an alternative type of dialogue, one detached from the political lens, uh, supposedly through which the Cypriot situation was most commonly presented. Um, it's, um, it's a bit schizophrenic, actually, when you hear some of the claims of leaps of faith. Um, but in fact, it was quite interesting at the time because people were still very numb from the opening of the borders. And I'm not saying about people who perhaps were involved in bicommunal uh, activities and so forth, but a large majority of people that were not. And, and it almost gave them this incentive to explore, particularly artists, uh, to explore the potential of this zone. Um, now, Leaps of Faith really aimed to scrutinize the geographical particulars of the island, including its location between three continents, as a zone characterized by repetitive poli po uh, political friction. And um, most of the works were site-specific. They were created on site in communication with, area, with the area, the residents, and so forth. Again, it, they, they only brought the artists uh, from abroad for a very limited time period. So even Erdan Kosova, one of the curators, had a lot of doubts as to whether they actually managed um, you know, to create some sort of meaningful contact. Um, also, a lot of the Greek Cypriot artists were only presented in the south and Turkish Cypriots in the north, so you had limited movement. One of the few projects um, that did trigger some sort of movement uh, was Call 192. It was produced by uh, Maria Loisidu, Haris Palabai, Shodis, and Socrates Stratis. They used two bus routes, one on each side of the buffer zone as a kind of mirror route. The people were invited to cross the buffer zone and take the bus trip with a member of the artist team. And then there was maps, sketches, drawings, etc., which were presented in the buffer zone uh, in this structure that you see here in between the two buses. And it really played a lot with people's memories and um, you know, how they experienced the crossing, you know, so. Um, <laughs> 
Um, subsequently, a book was produced by Haris Pelabai Shodis and David Officer. Um, and uh, very interestingly, the first trip that was taken on this bus was by uh, Peter, Lo Peter Loizos, uh, a very renowned Cypriot anthropologist. And um, in the book that came out later on, uh, Peter Loizos is quoted from this transcriptions uh, as writing, and I quote here, the hope is that no matter how deadlocked things are at the leadership level, there will always be more and more small things happening, which are about normalizing relationships between human beings who have been divided by other human beings. And um, he notes uh, the importance of interpersonal relationships, which is something that you see uh, very much um, as a key actual uh, uh, notion of how uh, to trigger collaboration. Uh, and this is actually echoed by political theorists such as Costas M. Costandino, who argues for social, legal, artistic, intellectual tactics to unsettle ethnic reification and bring from historical insight as to uh, the contingency of our identity. And the tactics can be used to overcome uh, these limitations or, uh, and these barriers. Um, Pelabai Shodis himself um, really connects uh, their framework of working to a dialogical and a discursive practice of art. And for me, this project was very important because it allowed me to connect uh, perhaps what was going on at a more global level with the social practice of art to the more local dimension uh, of the way that art was used in, uh, in the peace building mechanism. Um, I quote Helen as well in my paper. <laughs> because of the way that this exhibition was perceived at the local level and, um, and the criticism that can and should be exercised when you have these large-scale um, uh, contemporary art exhibitions coming in funded by uh, peace-building bodies because this exhibition was funded again by USA, the UNDP uh, and so forth and, and, and how do they function uh, and, and what do they bring about? And this is one picture that Peter Loizos took uh, from, uh, from the edges of the buffer zone during this trip. Uh, and this brings me to my last example, which is Manifesto 6 in 2006, the biannual that never happened. Uh, when I first started my PhD, people in London would tell me, oh, but you're going to do on social practice in Cyprus. Have you never heard of Manifesto? Which was quite funny because, of course, you know, obviously I knew of Manifesto, but, and also how we could learn from Manifesto, you know, because um, at, at the local level and how, and how we handle this uh, type of contemporary large-scale international projects coming in uh, and coming into contact with what's going on on the ground on a more grassroots level. Uh, now, Manifesto 6 you, um, was intended to be an art school operating in both north and south sectors of Nicosia for a period of uh, three months in late 2006. Um, it was to be curated by Maya Abueldahab, Florian Valvogel, and Anton Vidogle, who came together for the project. Uh, locally, Manifesto was administered by Nicosia for uh, art organization, NFA, which was under the umbrella of local governance, and that's very important in our case. And it was managed by the director of the Nicosia Municipal Arts Center, Yannis Tumaziz. Uh, Manifesta wanted to challenge the conventional large-scale exhibition format and they proposed this socially engaged temporary art school that would have three departments, each revolving around diverse cultural issues and debates. Uh, they were to involve a, a large amount of um, cultural producers, not just artists, um, very few actually from Cyprus, mostly from abroad. Uh, and they were borrowing a lot from um, theoretical groundwork such as Ivan Elif's uh, Deschooling Society or the Black Mountain College, uh, etc. Um, it was very important for them that we did not have a, a fine art school at the time, which is actually a, a, a huge matter of debate in Cyprus for many, many years. Um, they wanted to uh, use this situational framework to create a social context that would connect the two sectors of the city and create movement uh, in the polarized landscape. Uh, the art school never materialized because of disagreements, again, over property use. I mean, for years people have been saying how 
the Cyprus problem is a property uh, problem. Uh, Katerina Bizanias, who uh, wrote about uh, Manifesta, said that um, even before to the collapse, there was a lot of mounting frustration from the local art uh, actors uh, because they felt that they were excluded uh, by the international curators. Um, their decision to hold uh, the school in the north part of the island um, meant that the major funders, because they were from the south, they were from the Republic of Cyprus, including the Nicosia municipality, the government, the state, and the Cyprus Tourism Organization, they were not happy with the limelight that was to be pushed to the north, and the curators were fired. Uh, the NFA, the Nicosia for Arts Organization, uh, sued uh, the International Manifesto Foundation, and the case ended up in European courts. Uh, the failure of collaboration revealed the limitation uh, of contemporary art systems in the face of, of ethno-national politics. And the failure and fallout um, was very much discussed in local and international press, in efflux, in postmodern events such as United Nations Plaza, and so forth. Um, uh, Claire Bishop um, writes uh, about the cancellation of Manifesta as the moment in, in her brain uh, of the turn towards the educational, this pedagogical uh, turn of contemporary art. Um, Yannis Tumaziz, um, who was the local actor, a uh, key figure, uh, released a small booklet on the subject in 2012, and there he really discussed the general impact of politics on art, the role of the curator in a globalized arena, and the failure of the global art world to take into account local complexities and political issues. Um, and he brought to attention the disagreement between the three curators uh, in a letter and in, in an email that he included in the appendix of the book, uh, which demonstrated uh, that the three curators were creating three different art schools because of their own disagreement. Um, now, in the answer of the curators, very quickly after the collapse, they said that from the start, Manifesta 6 was to, have, to happen in the spirit of bicommunality. Um, I think one must wonder, however, to what extent the curators actually studied the extant artistic frameworks of collaboration in a conflict transformation art context that existed already in Nicosia. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, even though bicommunalism was positioned as a core aspect of the project, together with open social pedagogical format proposed, uh, due to the collapse, we never actually uh, know uh, what would have happened. Um, perhaps if they had chosen another organization, uh, perhaps, you know, Veste, which uh, uh, was much more uh, working uh, in a contemporary art world at the time, perhaps it would have been easier uh, for it to take place. Uh, because of the many antagonisms um, uh, uh, that were examined, this idea of not just antagonism but failure uh, is very important. Um, and the curator themselves, in, in their own writing about it afterwards, um, say very different kind of stuff. I was actually with, um, I don't know, maybe some of you know her, Pelin Tan, the other day, because she's in Cyprus at the moment, uh, at the University of Cyprus doing a fellowship, and she was commenting how Anton Vidogle is so deeply traumatized that um, he couldn't ever come back to Cyprus. Uh, but, you know, um, they write in very different ways. So um, El Dahab writes that we should reconsider how we go into political context. And um, Wald Vogel, uh, on, the other say, on the other hand, says how they were naive uh, in thinking that a project of this caliber could be realized in such a political atmosphere and we would need to think, uh, rethink the idea of a globalizing approach uh, a globalized Western approach to art. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I think um, at the local level, I mean, at the international level, obviously it was examined in many different types of, uh, of post mortar events and analyzed and so forth. Um, I think at the local level, it showed the need that when we have organizations of this type, that we really start to consider. Uh, how art has intervened uh, in politics uh, 
and politics and art in this very specific scenario because um, and not just uh, as notions but also very practically uh, through its funding mechanisms and what it means in terms of uh, how we are censored, what we are allowed to say, which you see actually subsequently in other types of exhibitions. And um, uh, I, I'd like to finish um, uh, by saying that uh, at the moment there is a large body of research on art undertaken by political theorists and there's also a growing use of political theory to analyze art. Uh, there is a greater involvement of states, NGOs, international bodies in shaping engaged and activist art practices. The popularization of social practices together with the use of art to address conflicted uh, frameworks uh, can be read as this need of art to be useful, uh, sometimes uh, even uh, used as this uh, strange tool for the fight of, uh, uh, of human rights. Um, and I think it's paranoia is very much exemplified by this painting by Jonathan Cook. Um, um, the back is a UN uh, outpost and he created a, a slide. Uh, like a water slide that uh, um, goes down into the sand and into the barbed wires. Um, a, in an examination of politics and aesthetics, Rancière argues that since the turn of the 21st century, there has been an increasing frequent talk of art having returned to politics, um, highlighting that the idea uh, that art is presumed to be politically effective. Uh, he believes that the politics of art suffers from a strange schizophrenia. Uh, he writes that the ethical turn would mean today that there is an increasing tendency to submit politics and art to moral judgments about the validity of their principles and the consequences of their practice and speaks about this reign of ethics not being the reign of moral judgment over the operation of art or of political action but um, an indistinct sphere of operation um, where political and artistic practices are dissolved and uh, submission of discourse and practice in, the same, in an indistinct point of view. Actually, the indistinctness that he refers to uh, really describes the situation of working within and across the separate buffer zone through art. And I think most of the people that still continue to work at the moment, uh, despite definitely a downturn in the activity, uh, would actually talk about that. And, um, uh, and also the indistinctness that exists of what it means that such international bodies funded by uh, specific countries through the international organization bring about a blurring of politics and art and what types of politics and how art is used as this presumed glue to challenge political division um, and that supposedly alone uh, the arts can be uh, a catalyst and enablers uh, for community action and dialogue and transforming antagonism. And in all three languages of Nicosia, thank you, Afkaristote Shagiler.